Being born in 1992 and growing up a 90s kid, uh, one of my favorite TV shows, although it came out in the 80s, uh, is, it's got to be the TV show Transformers. Anybody ever watch it? Some fans out there. Okay, cool. Optimus Prime, definitely the best, okay? Um, but Transformers, my favorite TV show growing up as a kid. Um, and it, it was, it's just fascinating that these robots coming down to Earth could look just like a car, a lot of sports cars and any vehicle really, and they can look like these, these, these cars and vehicles, but then in an instant, they would become these fighting big machines, right? And they would transform um, and protect planet Earth and the humans, and it was really cool to see that. And it was just crazy to me that this was even a concept. And it's no coincidence that one of my favorite verses in the Bible has to do with transformation and transforming, and that's in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And it says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Transformation has been a huge part of my life. Uh, my siblings and I, we saw this in uh, our parents uh, growing up. My dad was working a really cushy six-figure job in New York City. Uh, my mom wanted nothing to do with the church, but uh, my dad ended up going and getting saved and uh, getting a call into full-time ministry, which then trickled down into the rest of us kids and our entire family, um, and we became a pastor's family. Um, and so that kind of transformed our family. And now having uh, two little guys of my own, Levi, who's two and a half, and Weston, who's going to be two in just a couple days, uh, there's, should be, there's us, yeah. Um, Levi is obviously the one big cheese in. Um, and Weston, that, he was about a week or so old there. Um, if you hear me yelling at anybody in the hallway, it's probably my kid and not yours. So just, just to let you know, your kid's probably fine. Um, but my wife, and, my wife and I, Becca, we love to go back and look at pictures of the two of them, uh, especially Levi, like now that he's a little older. We love looking at pictures of them growing up and seeing where they were and how big they've gotten and how they've grown, and how they have transformed into who they are now, and their personalities. In this passage, Paul is writing to the new believers, believers who are so on fire for following God, but their past continues to haunt them. These things that they were doing continue to come back and try to creep back into their lives. Their friends keep calling them back to the sinful things that they were doing. Their minds keep going back to the thoughts that they were having. And since the gospel message was only at the beginning stages of being spread, the world that these new believers were living in did not support or really follow the Christian values that Paul was teaching with, his, with the gospel. Many people believe that when you accept Jesus into your heart, that like you reached it, you did it, you made it all the way to the end, you've reached the goal, and you've crossed the finish line. This is the misconception that once you accept Christ into your heart, that everything's going to be good, and it's going to be all honky-dory, and you're never going to be tempted again, and you know life's going to be super easy, and sugar plums and candy canes are going to be on your doorstep every morning. Um, but that's not how it always happens. Instead, this is a new relationship that is actually taking place and a beautiful relationship that we get to daily choose to follow Jesus, that we get to daily choose to follow in the steps that he has planned out for our lives. But one of the biggest enemies of this renewing of ourselves is conforming to the worldly things. You see, we are to be transformed into the likeness of God by daily turning away from our sin and turning to living the life that God has for us and that Paul was talking about in the chapters leading up to this verse. This is something that I personally have to do every single day. I'm not perfect. None of the other pastors are perfect. God is perfect. 
And so we have to do our part in choosing to do this every single day. Daily, I need to choose Jesus to be more like him in the way that I talk, the way that I act, the things that I think. And if you hang out with a group of people long enough, you start to talk like them. You start to act like them. You start to even dress like them. And if you're around the right group, you might even start to smell like them. My wife's family lives down in Texas, beautiful state. Um, If I was to retire somewhere, that's probably where it would be. But we went down there and uh, I came back with a pair of leather cowboy boots, growing up a kid that hated country, came back with cowboy boots and I walked around and now I say, hey, y'all. You really do. The people that you hang out with, you start to talk and act and, 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 and dress like them. If you spend enough time with Jesus, you'll start to talk like him. You'll start to act like him. You'll start to think like him. You'll be more like him. And when I choose Jesus over the world, I then am able to decipher his plans for me, his will for me. And through his leading, God has brought me here to Bethany to lead the kids' ministry. And the leaders and myself, we want to instill these truths into the kids, that they don't have to choose what the world is saying is good and what feels good, but that they can daily choose to follow Jesus Christ and that they can daily choose to follow what is good, and to do what he says for their lives. And so if you have a child um, that would fit in the kids' ministry age range, um, and you're a parent of that child or grandparent, whoever, uh, and you have questions about some upcoming events or what's happening with BWC Kids, um, or maybe you're sitting here and you're like, you know what? I want to be able to have an impact on this younger generation, and I want to help them be transformed into the likeness of God. Following the service, I'll be back by the sound booth, and I would love to talk to you more about this. But I pray that you would leave this place choosing daily to allow God to transform your life. Life would be so much easier if we had a roadmap, right? It would be so much easier if people told us exactly what to do next, what choices to make, where to go. I know for me, and you can ask my family, it would be so much easier. It would alleviate a lot of the stress and anxiety I face when I have to make a decision. And for part of our life, we are given some sort of roadmap, right? So we go to maybe pre-K, and then we go to elementary school, and then middle school. I went to Northwestern because I grew up in Neutropoli. Um, And then you go to high school. But then from there, you kind of have to decide what you're going to do. I was a student here at Bethany, and so I went to youth camp um, with our youth group. And during that time, my senior year, I felt a very clear call into ministry. And so I decided to go to Indiana Wesleyan University, and I intended to graduate and someday go overseas as a missionary. Now, obviously, that is not the case because I'm here in front of you preaching. Um, But through God's kindness and his faithfulness to me, he has brought me to this point. I have the privilege every week um, with Pastor Josh to lead our BWC students, so that's our youth group, and then also the Next Gen service, um, which happens right now during the 1045 service over in the gym. And it's a service for kids in grades one through five, and we play games, we sing songs and dance around. There's a message and there's a small group time. Um, And for me, the small group time is the absolute best because it's the time where the kids ask these really great questions and they say these really deep things And I'm like, wow, I never thought about that in my faith. Um, And so if that's something that you're interested in, like Pastor Peter said, we will be back by the sound booth and we can tell you more about that. Um, But it has been such a gift in my life and it's not something I would have chosen on my own. But in the decision-making process, in having to choose what I was going to do with my life, I wish I could say that I was super confident and I was super faithful and excited, but the reality is I was not. Um, I would sometimes be very fearful and um, doubting God's heart, 
And that's okay because we're humans. God knows that about the, us. But this has been a verse for me that I'm going to look at, we're going to look at today that has encouraged me. And so I hope that it's an encouragement for you as well. And it is Isaiah 41, verses 13 through 14. It says, For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear. I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm Jacob. Little Israel, do not fear. For I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And so Isaiah, the book of Isaiah was written to the Israelite nation. And the first part of the book is about the consequences of their sin and about what was going to be happening. Invaders would be coming in and they would be taken away from their land. But then the second part of the book is kind of um, Isaiah's reminder to the people that even though these hard things are going to happen, God is still good and he still has a plan and he still has a purpose in our lives. And so it was written to the entire community, but it's also written to individuals. And so today I want us to receive that as a church, but also as individuals. The first line says, for I am the Lord your God. I love the intimacy of this verse because he's not just saying, I'm the God of Israel, I'm the God of Isaiah. He's saying, I am the Lord your God, not just the God of your Sunday school teachers or whoever else might have influenced you. God knows us all individually. He knows our names. He knows our favorite color. He is the Lord our God. The next line says, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm Jacob. Little Israel, do not fear, for I myself will help you. I have a couple nieces and nephews, and this week I got to babysit my niece, Kenley, and we have a picture of her. She is a year and three months old, um, and so she's chubby and we love her, she's great. Um, but she is starting to walk around, and so we'll put her little sneakers on her when she goes outside, and she just starts to walk everywhere that she can. But she's a baby, and so she's not a good walker. Um, and so she will flip, er, sorry, she will trip over flat surfaces, and um, she sometimes just like starts to wobble just when she's standing there. She's not good at walking, and that's okay, right? So sometimes when we take her outside to go play on the playset, I'll walk alongside her and I'll have to grab hold of her hand. And I'll walk with her through the grass and then I'll help her cross from the grass to the pavement because that's a very scary thing for a one-year-old. But I'm with her the whole time. And I can't help but imagine when it says, who takes hold of your right hand and says, do not fear, that that's the Lord with us. That he grabs hold of our little hand and he walks with us the steps we need to take. This last line says, declares the Lord your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. So who is this person that is your God individually and as a church? Who is this person that takes hold of your hand and walks with you in the ways that you need to go? It tells us right here, it says the Lord. This is the God who created everything, who created the entire world, your redeemer. This is the God who loved us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross so that we could have a relationship with him, the Holy One of Israel. And so this morning, um, I don't know what you're dealing with, but I wanna encourage you with this, this verse. Life probably would be a whole lot easier with a roadmap, but the cool thing is that as believers, we don't need that. We don't need a roadmap because we have something even better. We have the Holy Spirit, we have the God of the whole universe, those of us that are believers living inside of us who is walking with us, grabbing our hand, helping us every step of the way. So whatever decision you're facing today, um, maybe you have a health decision or you have a choice that you need to make about work. Um, maybe you're just discouraged and you just need a little bit of hope. Maybe you're stepping into a new season of life. I'm gonna read this verse again. And where it says, little Israel, I want you to insert your name into that verse. So you can say it out loud, to your, out loud, you can say it quietly to yourself, whatever you need to do. But when I read it, I'm going to say little Alana. And so I wanna just read this and I want us to receive it as God's word to us this morning. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm Jacob, Little Alana, do not fear, 
For I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. As Pastor Alana just mentioned moments ago, this is not our normal setting. Usually we're down the hall and we're hanging out with the kids and teaching them. And I would be lying if I said you guys were more cute than they are. Uh, They're definitely a a cuter crowd, but I don't have to worry about you guys picking your nose and sticking it on your neighbors. So I am excited for that this morning. We are glad to be here. I have had the privilege to both attend and serve at this church For the last 20 years, and as I stand before you today, I can say that I personally am so grateful for BWC. I grew up in a family who took going to church very seriously. Many um, of of days we would be here setting up chairs, we would be here uh, setting up events, and we were homeschooled so we could do that. We had a pretty flexible schedule, and the more I was here the more I realized how badly I wanted to be here. Church was home for me. And being at church gave me the opportunity to interact with a whole bunch of different people, and I know that this community here has shaped me into who I am today. I'm so grateful for the many pastors and the many leaders of this church who have poured into me and who have seen me thrive through that experience. I'm especially grateful for the youth group here that I was a part of in some of my most formative years. It became pretty clear to me early on that I was feeling a call into full-time ministry. And I think it's so incredible that Pastor Alana and I are back here today at a place that poured into us. And now we get to pour into other students and play a similar role there. If you are sitting here today and you're in 6th through 12th grade, I want to connect with you and personally invite you to join us at Youth Group. We're meeting Sunday nights from 6 to 7.30. That's starting tonight. And we're going to be meeting uh, until the end of this school year. And if, if you know someone who we don't have a connection to who falls within that age range, we want you to extend that invitation for us and invite them as well. We meet right down the hall in our gym and we have a crazy game time. We have a message time. We do small groups and we have all kinds of other crazy activities activities, and events. For me, youth group was a place that pushed me to grow and reminded me to put God first in every situation. When I turned 15, I began working my first full-time job, and it became clear to me pretty early on that my childhood was different than many of the people my age who were around me. I wasn't completely oblivious to the world, but I realized that I did not struggle with many of the things that teenagers my age were facing. I wasn't struggling with all of those temptations and sort of addictions. I didn't think too much about why my life was different at first. I knew it was, but I didn't think too much about it until later on. I realized that this couldn't have been by accident. My parents were very intentional with who and what I allowed myself to be surrounded by regularly. And so realizing this led me to a verse in the Bible that has become one of my favorites and that I use to remind myself of truth regularly. And it's a short and simple verse, but I promise if you take it and you apply it to your life, it will make a world of difference. If you're ready to hear this verse, say yes. Yes. If you're ready to hear this verse, say yes. yes. They're awake now. That verse is 1 Corinthians 15, 33, and it simply says this. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to a newer church who is facing a lot of different problems. They were located in a city that overflowed with people, and this city was specifically known for their idolatry and sexual sin. It had become clear to Paul that even people in the church in this city were starting to deal with some of these problems. And so Paul is writing this letter to help correct some of those things before he goes and visits them in person. With that in mind, we can understand that when Paul says bad company corrupts good character, he is telling the church to stop listening to people and to stop listening to thoughts that are pushing them away from the way God wants them to act. 
like the Corinthians, we all have had moments in our lives where we compromise our character and listen to people or thoughts that didn't line up with what God wanted for us. We have allowed things and people to take hold of our heart and to corrupt the good character we have. And like the Corinthians, we need a reminder to shape up and clean up our act and return to God. And that's the exact role that this verse played in my life for many years. Bad company will always do its best to creep into our lives. However, it becomes much harder for that bad company to stay when you have a reminder in your head from the scripture about what it can do and what God is calling you to. Having the knowledge of who God is and what he has done for us should make a difference in our lives and it should affect the way we carry ourselves. Along with the Corinthians, we have absolutely no excuse to be indifferent towards God and yet for some reason, we find ourselves there regularly. Choosing God over everything else in life isn't easy, but I promise you that it becomes easier once you start cutting that bad company out of your life. And so for you sitting here today, maybe that bad company is some sort of addiction. Maybe it's a specific relationship. Maybe it's a device that's containing something you know you shouldn't be going to. Or maybe it's something else that we allow into our lives to corrupt our character. No matter how little or how big that presence is in our lives, if we want to put God first, we must get rid of it. That company needs to go. While this is usually a difficult and a painful process, today I am so glad to stand before you and to say that we do not serve a God who leaves us in our weakness or in our pain. I am glad to stand before you today and to tell you that we serve a God who promises I will never leave or forsake you no matter what you are going through. And I promise that with God on your side and the body of Christ here to surround you and lift you up, that there is victory waiting for you in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Woo. My challenge for each of you today is to take some time this week and to reflect and to see where that bad company is in your life. And like we said, just because you identify doesn't mean God's going to take it away right away. It's going to be a process and it may be painful, but that victory is there for you in Christ. Church, I want to remind you that God loves you so much. Do not be afraid to lean into him in every situation, whether you find yourself on the mountaintop or you find yourself in the valley. God is there for you and he loves you. And would you join me in a word of prayer? Who, God, we are so thankful to come before you today as the church and to just give you the glory and the honor. Father, you've been so good to us even when we don't deserve it. And so help us to spend the rest of our lives trying to pay back what you have done for us. Father, help us to press into you for strength. Help us to put you first. God, we needed you yesterday. We need you today. And Father, we're going to need you forevermore. God, help us to rely on you. Lord, Today we need you. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said...